everyone. Thank you all for being here with me today. This is such a big deal to me. Um, this is my first time speaking at AppSec California. Um, yay! <laughs> Um, and I'm excited to really share with you guys my experience with the management of vulnerabilities. Um, for the most part, I've been you know, surrounded by a lot of technical folks. And if you've read my bio or know anything about me, I am not an engineer. Yet I've spent my entire career in security working on technical projects, whether network segmentation or DDoS and so on. And what I really realized is that um, it's not really about knowing or being a subject matter expert about solving these complex problems, but there was a lot of value in thinking about the process and the management and how we solve these problems. And that's where I step in. Um, after today, I hope you learn a thing or two about improving your vulnerability management program or get some tips out of it. So when I first started, it's funny because I, I got hired at this company and um, the first thing my boss asked me to do was, hey, do you know anything about vulnerability management? Can you help us with this program? We need, to fix, we need to fix what's going on here. And so the first thing I did was call up all my friends at these other companies. I was like, hey, hey, uh, I think I called Flea and some other people. I was like, what are you guys doing over there for vulnerability management? And um, everyone sort of had the same answer. And it was, uh, yeah, compliance is happy with us. Or, yeah, you know, we're doing a good job. We use some tool. And I actually have a tool, but then I work off of a sheet. And like I do a lot of finger, uh, shoulder tapping to everyone. Does that sound familiar to anyone? So either A, I was like, okay, vulnerability management, there's like this huge secret. Nobody wants to tell me how they're doing it, and I need to figure this out, otherwise I'm going to get fired. Or B, maybe everyone could be doing a better job at vulnerability management. Everything I'm going to discuss with you today is really about my own experience with the program, not having done this anywhere else but my current company. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to either relate to or weigh the maturity and health of your own program within your organization. So whether you're a manager, a director, maybe a PM like myself, um, you're going to leave with some tangible tips that you can apply today or tomorrow um, to improve your organization's health and maturity of your program. Uh, this is Harshal. He's my boss. He was supposed to be co-presenting with me today. Conveniently canceled last minute, and so I'm going to do my best to do this presentation by myself. He's amazing. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Alexandra Nassar. I'm the PM for the security team at Medallia. Aside from being a scrum master and practicing agile methodologies and hosting meetings and projects and programs, um, my best asset and what I love to do is really mend the relationship between the security team and the developers. And I do that by making security fun. A little bit about me, I love soccer. I'm a Barcelona soccer fan. Uh, I'm also a certified referee. And I, among a couple things on my dislikes, I don't like public speaking. <laughs> All right, let's jump into it. Vulnerability management. Um, when I look at this picture, it really represents the sentiment of the program that I was jumping into, right? When I started, the program we had was broken. It was messy. It was unpredictable. It was just vulnerable. And I needed to change that mindset. I needed to change vulnerability management from the ground up. So there were some obvious pain points up front that stood out to me. Let me know if any you can relate to any of these four points. Um, do you guys have, like, there was an adversarial relationship between the engineers and the security team? So, for example, a security team got frustrated because they would put out, push out all these vulnerabilities, and then they would sit in a queue, and nothing would get remediated, and then the finger was pointing back at security, like, come on, why are these vulnerabilities still open? That was from the security perspective. There was also minimal collaboration between the reporters and the responders. So again, I did um, lots of shoulder tapping, and I noticed that once a vulnerability was triaged and input in a queue, then the, the person responding you know, wasn't working with the security team or, or having them answer any specific questions that they needed. It was like either a tool or, or someone putting minimal description in the fields. So they needed to work together to get these vulnerabilities remediated. There was a lack of ownership um, and accountability for the engineers. Um, in resolving these issues. So, for example, if a ticket was, um, a, a critical ticket was created and the developers saw that ticket in their queue, they didn't know how to prioritize that ticket against all the other work, right? Their, their perspective was like, uh, we have all these other initiatives and I have all these other priorities. Where does this vulnerability fit in my queue of things I need to work on in the sprint? And lastly, there was a bad user experience for everyone involved in the process. 
So do we use one tool? Do we use many tools? Like um, maybe the tool wasn't being um, utilized at its best or configured correctly. We had tons of one-off cases and the, the tool we were using just couldn't capture all those one-off scenarios. So bad documentation. And then there was always like, we relied too much on one individual. You know that person in your company that's been there forever, has a lot of history, um, knows all the answers, and then all of a sudden they get sick or they're getting married and they're gone for a period of time and then the backlog builds again. So just relying on one individual just wasn't holding through for us. Okay, so the first thing I did before I took on trying to take on this program was really understand my user's perspective. My users, I think of as my customers. My customers are my security team, and my customers are the engineering organization, the developers. I heard a lot of feedback, and as I say a couple of these out loud, I want you to think in your head, have you said this to yourself? Have you said it out loud? Or do you guys um, relate to any of these in the, within your program? All right, what vulnerabilities? I didn't know I had vulns assigned to me. That was a really big issue because as soon as I opened the backlog and I'd open a ticket, I see a person's name on the assignee, on the assignee part field, but they weren't being worked on. So that just tells me there was a disconnect between um, what they were supposed to do. Maybe they didn't know that they had a backlog of vulnerabilities. Maybe their management's not telling them to check this backlog. I'm just gonna ignore these until they go away. Do you guys have a bunch of minors that, minor vulnerabilities that just sits in your queue and no one works on because it's just not important enough? Or that's what they say. You guys are ruining my product roadmap. Security is always blocking us for doing everything. Or yeah, I'll fix them. Security is great. Your initiatives are fantastic. We love security. And then you check the ticket and it's like not going to be remediated until two years later. The idea here is that I wanted to ch shift the mindset and change the perspective of what I was hearing about our program. Okay, so to set this up, after I did all those interviews with the engineers, their managers, leadership, even the PMO, I decided I was ready for a brand new beginning. And I wanted to build this program essentially answering any question I needed to fall into these three categories. There's a self-service aspect, accountability, and culture. I know, what the hell does culture have to do with vulnerability management, but we'll get in there. Um, one of the biggest complaints I heard from developers was that they felt that security was mandating all the logistics around remediation. So I thought about that, and I think what that really meant was that they wanted to say or input in the process. They didn't want to just be told, this is the SLA, and this is what you have to do in this given time frame. That's not fair, right? They, they should be able to scope the work. So. I was thought, okay, how can we make engineers want to be part of this process and care? So let's build a more collaborative environment and less shoulder tapping, right? Less shoulder tapping for me and more self-service aspect, getting the engineers involved earlier on. And I'll deep dive into what that looks like. On the accountability front, this is another aspect we needed to incorporate better. It wasn't just about SLAs, but really setting the expectation and not just pointing out the weak spots weak areas with metrics, but counting our successes, and then identifying trends and to be able to tell a story to leadership. I'll talk about performance scorecards and how we handle escalations in that section. And then lastly, I'll dive into culture. This is the most important aspect for me because it really changes like the sentiment around how people feel about your program, right? If there's a positive sentiment around it, people are more likely to want to participate. If everyone doesn't like vulnerability management and they feel like they're being told what to do, they're less likely to participate and help move along the vulnerabilities towards remediation. So I'll jump into marketing and all that fun stuff. Um, so again, shifting the mindset. Okay, let's start with self-service. I broke this down into three areas. There's the tool, there's the workflow itself, and then there's the user experience. This is all based off of the feedback I was hearing from everyone. Although I want to break this down even further, I'm just going to focus on um, a couple of things and challenges I had to think about within each of these categories. And if you want to dig deeper and talk more, I'm, I'll be here after, message me, and we'll, we'll figure it out. So on the tool side, as any good manager or PM would do, you take into consideration cost and your timeline and all that fun stuff. Um, for me, right, when I join an organization, 
uh, I get hired because I mend the relationship between security and the developers, right? So my thing was, at this point, I didn't want to step in and tell developers what they needed to do. I wanted to listen to them and hear their feedback. So what I did was I waved my white flag up, and my security team was like, whoa, what are you doing? Like, tell them what to do. Why are you stepping forward? I raised my, the white flag, and I said, OK, what are you guys using? What's your preference on managing vulnerabilities? Tell me. And so uh, they were using Jira. Um, we internally were at Zendesk and a couple other tools. There was a bunch of tools. And so I said, OK, so the, the engineers prefer using Jira. I'm just going stick to with, stick with what we have and then build, some, build a nice workflow off of that. So that really wasn't the challenge. Like, pick a tool um, that everyone's happy with. But the challenge for me really was deciding on where that project was going to live. So I had two options at this point. So if you've worked with Jira, you know that there's, you have a project, you can have a project per team, or however you guys have it configured. In my case, it was each team had their own project, and they managed their work within their project. So like for example, this uh, SRE team has like tasks and stories and et cetera. They want, I was going to insert vulnerability vulns as an issue type within this project. The second option, by the way, this was like more preferable. I wanted to go this route because I thought like everyone managed their work properly. Uh, the second option was just creating a whole new project within Jira called Security Vulnerabilities. I actually went this route. I went this route because I finally realized after interviewing everyone that they weren't good at managing their backlog in queue. They say they're agile or they have a scrum master, but they weren't doing true scrum. They weren't planning pr correctly. And so I didn't want my volumes to just fall into a queue of 100 other issue types and like not get attention. So I was like, I'm creating a project. This is security vulnerabilities. I'm going to have more flexibility on building out this workflow. So I, if I stuck with their projects, I would have to stick with their internal workflow, like open, in progress, done. And I wanted to build mine out. Um, to be more customizable and, and allow that more self-service aspect, which you'll see in a moment how this um, relates to that. So by isolating the, the vulnerability project, I was going to set myself up for success for the story around self-service. OK. Dun, dun, dun. This is complex, I know. Don't get anxiety over it. This is an actual screenshot of my workflow today. It changes all the time. Um, the important thing here before I jump into the workflow is that ask, you know, you need to ask your teams, take a step back and ask them, define what a vulnerability is to your organization. Like I know it seems obvious, but like if you don't define it with everyone together, sometimes you, there's a lot of one-off cases and you didn't consider, that you didn't consider. So think about like whether you have pen tests or architecture reviews, maybe internally or externally reported vulnerabilities coming in. Um, maybe you use Qualys or Nessus, some sort of tool. You have a bug bounty program. The first thing I did was make sure that all of these sources were going to funnel through the same workflow. So when I joined, everything was using different tools, and it was really hard to manage and stay organized. So that's what we did. We defined what a vulnerability meant for us, and we defined what sources we'd accept as being vulnerabilities. Things to think about at this point when you start building out your workflow. For me, when a ticket was opened, whether a human or a tool, we needed there to be proper triaging in place. Before a ticket was uh, created automatically and assigned out to a team, and what I noticed was teams weren't working on those vulnerabilities because there wasn't enough information in there. They didn't feel like there was the customer service aspect, or they didn't feel like they were working with a human to help them get them through. So I would put a gateway in place and made sure that my team was doing proper triaging. So you'll see here, I added. Um, two statuses, in triage and triage. And I'm going to show a demo of what that looks like and how cool it is when you toggle between those. Um, all right. By having this in place and making sure my team was doing what they needed to do, it gave us more credibility. That credibility took us so far because when other developing teams saw that we were doing our part, then they were more likely to um, move forward in the remediation process and take us more serious. If I am lucky, a vuln will start from the open, funnel down to triage, acknowledge, scope, deployed, and remediated, right? Follows through that nice line and that pathway. But again, I said there's tons of one-off cases. 
you guys all have different scenarios. Like sometimes a bone's worked on and something is mitigated. Like how do you capture that in a, in a workflow? So a couple of things I've added. I'm not going to dissect this completely, but a couple cool things that work well for me are introducing the due date proposed field after acknowledge. So what that essentially means is when we have a vulnerability, our team triages a ticket, and based off of a priority or risk level, we assign a, an SLA. So let's say it's critical, and let's just say 30 days. That'll be the due date that's in the ticket. What I do is allow the engineering teams to scope the work properly, and they can come back if they're not OK due to resources, due to their sprint schedule, due to like a high initiative in the organization. They can't hit that date. Then I expect them to scope the work and tell them that they're going to propose a new due date. So I have that due date proposed field. And then it goes through an assessment through security, and security can approve that or reject it with the click of a button. Super easy. I can't wait to show you. Um, other things I have on here are like proposed risk acceptance. That's if maybe you have some vulnerabilities and it was due to this feature, it's mitigated somehow, and so it changes, sever changes the severity. So you have the opportunity to um, account for that and, tell, and ask security to accept the risk or, or not. So that was another one-off case. I have other things like superseded. That helps a lot with duplicates. I know you can um, tag tickets in JIRA as like duplicates, but this helps a lot. For example, if you like have a patch and um, you run a new scan and you have like a new master ticket and like it, it, it um, accounts for a bunch of different vulnerabilities that were in the queue. So I use the superseded a lot so that teams don't feel like there's hundreds of vulnerabilities in their dashboard because that's also annoying, right? I don't want to. I just don't want to dump tickets. I just want to make sure everything's relevant and easy for both parties. OK. OK. The key takeaway here isn't that this is the best workflow or this is the one that you're supposed to use. The idea here is that every status is there for a reason. I literally went to old vulnerabilities, like our whole backlog that we've already remediated. And I sampled a bunch. I took every use case, and I made sure that everything could follow and toggle through a workflow somehow. So make sure it makes sense to your organization. All right. Aside from the workflow and building that out, I had to make sure that our JIRA had the proper fields in place. So whether you're a JIRA admin or you know a JIRA admin in IT, customize this to make sense for, for your organization. I had in here um, fields that were relevant to the developer side and what they work on. And I just took all that noise out and just made sure that we only had what was relevant for, for the security team and for the engineers. So a couple of things, just really quick, that I changed was, for example, priority. In security, we use the word risk level. And what I noticed was the developing teams didn't understand if there was a high risk, like how that prioritized on their backlog. So the developing team, they used the word priority in my, organiz in my organization. Um, by doing that simple change, changing risk level to using their verbiage, now they know how to prioritize this work against everything else in their backlog. They understand that blocker means blocker, critical means crit critical, and so on. Um, we also started using the CVSS v3 scoring. Whatever scoring method you want to use is fine, but just make sure that it's universal and consistent. So um, we started using CVSS v3 scoring, and then I just inserted the vector in there just so if we ever needed to go back, we could, and it was easy. Team. Remember I told you in the beginning that we were assigning vulnerabilities to specific people? So I took that concept away, right? I didn't want to rely on an individual anymore. I wanted to enable teams to be able to manage their work properly, so we started using team. My, team know, my security team knows that when they triage, we do not assign a ticket to an individual. We put, it, we put a nice team name in there. And why this is super important, because all my queries and all my combo boards are filtered by team name now. So when I train everyone on how to use um, their dashboards, they know um, it's per team. I have release tag in there. That's super helpful for us to know when to validate in production. Source, remember I talked about the sources in the beginning? This is super convenient for me today because vulnerability management um, at my current organization um, is home to security and not 
owned by risk and compliance, but we work close with risk and compliance. So this just makes it easier for when our, our compliance team comes in and they need to look at some vulnerabilities. They just have the right information that they need without having to you know, shoulder tap on, on my shoulder and ask me so many questions. Like it's all in there for them. Um, due date, right? It's obvious to have a due date and a ticket, Alex. Mine's really different, again, because my due dates are flexible. I have a recommendation and then I allow for proper scoping and that due date might change. And I'll demo that in a moment. So we have a tool. We know, what we're, we know the information that my team needs to put input to triage. But really, what's a tool and all this information if you can't digest it? So that's where we had to keep going and take it to the next level. Um, are you guys familiar using Kanban boards in JIRA? Yeah, they're amazing. They are my organization go-to for everything. Um, this really enabled all of us in security and the de developing team to be more collaborative. And the number one complaint I heard with like having a backlog and having the tool in place was, hey, Alex, like I have all this information and I'm working on this ticket and I did my part, but I'm waiting for someone else to do something and I don't want to see this noise on my backlog. Like I have to keep writing down on a notepad like what I need to follow up on. It's really annoying, right? So it's like, okay, how can I make this easier for everyone so only relevant vulnerabilities show up on their board when they have work to do? And I'll go into that in a moment. So just note here that, so the top here is like a screenshot of my security team's dashboard and the bottom is just um, a sample of some developer, some team in engineering. On the security side, what's important, all, they care, all I care about at that point is for them to triage any vulnerabilities that come in. Remember that open status? Whether a tool or human, they need to do their proper work to triage, to give us credibility so other teams work on those. In progress just means as in triage. There's no, in that column, I configured it so no other status is in there except in triage. This is helpful because sometimes, you know, we all put things down and we all go work on something else and then our manager wants to know what we're working on or we need to re remind ourselves what we're working on. So that's why that's there. And then needing security attention. When a developing team merges something or is ready for validation or something's blocked by security or there's proposed risk acceptance or proposed a new due date, anything that requires action from security will fall into that um, column. On the developer team, the only thing that's relevant to them, so when it, before when a ticket was opened by a tool, it would automatically assign it to a team. But again, they weren't happy with the information that was in the ticket. And so with proper triaging, it doesn't go into the to acknowledge column until we've done the triage. So that's the first step for the developing team. Then they have to scope the work and then whatever's in progress is being worked on. And then I have the two other columns rejected and due date extensions. So like if they propose something and it's rejected, it would show up on their dashboard there and they'd know, okay, it needs to go back through rescoping. And same with the due date extension request. Because sometimes we request due date extensions, doesn't mean you stop working on it. So you just still wanna see what's on your board and what's in progress. Awesome, so let me show you what all that actually looks like. If I can do this. Cool, okay, so I have a sample application solutions team dashboard here. It's nice and clean. And then the other tab is the security team's dashboard. We see the same columns that I just went over in there. I'm gonna go and create a vulnerability, a sample vulnerability in, you see the project security vulnerabilities, issue type is vuln. And I put in a summary, just pretend I'm a tool or a human. It doesn't really matter at this point because everything's gonna uh, funnel through that gateway of triaging. We'll put a description, a CVSS score. <laughs> I'm gonna say it's a critical and I'm gonna give it a 30 day SLA. And it's gonna go to the application solutions team and I'm gonna create that vault. By the way, there's a lot more information in this ticket, but I can't show you all my tricks. <laughs> I'm gonna create this again, ta-da! Okay, it shows up on needs triaging. I'm in security, it's not on my application solutions team board. So they don't know that there's anything to be done at this point. So I'm gonna open that ticket and I'm gonna pretend I'm security now. And I'm gonna go in and say, I'm working on this today and it's in triage.
beautiful. So I go to my board and look, it's in progress. Everyone knows what I'm working on. Beautiful. So I'm going to go in here and actually do a triage, fake triage for you. I have the priority. I have the CVSS score, hopefully the vector. I have the team, I'm good with the date. And then the description, this is where triaging really comes in play and you put a lot of detailed um, information in here, any recommendations and so on. So this is getting filled out and I'm going to save this. Notice the due date is February 22nd from the 30 days I said based off of the priority critical. All right, triage is complete. I've done my work. I'm still good with the priority, still good with the due date. Any comments I want to insert in here? I'm a big fan of customer service. That totally changes the mindset of the relationship between security and developers. Have that, have that little smiley face in there in conversation with them. So triage is complete. And voila, it's not on my board. There's no relevant work that I need to do at this time as a security person. But now it shows up on the application solutions board as needing to be acknowledged. So I'm gonna go in there, and yes, it sits with my team, so I'm gonna acknowledge a ticket. This is something I could probably get rid of in the future, but it's relevant for me now because we're still figuring out who owns um, what vulnerabilities. It nicely moves into to scope. I know that next week when we start planning, I need to scope this vulnerability. And I look at the due date, let's say I'm scoping, and I'm like, ah, February 22nd. I don't know if I can do this, we just scoped it the work with my team, and I'm gonna propose a different due date. So I put it a week later due to resourcing and my sprint schedule. Put in a good comment in there for security to make a decision whether or not this is appropriate or not. Detail, detail, detail. I'm going to propose the due date. All right, see how the status change and due date proposed on the bottom right, like it shows up over there, and it shows up on my needs attention column. Now I know there's some work that I need to do as a security person, this is relevant. I need to go in there now and either accept or reject this based off of a uh, risk analysis, and for this case, I'm gonna accept it. And it, status now changes to scoped and it's off my board. Again, no work for me to do at this point with that vulnerability. And it becomes in progress for the application solutions team. So it's really clean and clear of what work needs to be done at that given time. So let's say I'm going in there and February 28th comes around to see the due date change now to February 28th, the proposed date that we approved. And it won't approve, it won't change that date unless security goes in there and actually approves it. And we've done what we need to do, we deployed it, and it moves over to done, but it's not crossed out, so it's still open and security goes in there, voila, it shows up on needs attention. I open it, I'm going to validate this. I'm gonna say they did a good job, it's remediated. Voila, off my board on the security team side and crossed out on the application solution side. So this is essentially how I use statuses um, in the workflow to toggle between and create a little bit more collaboration, less shoulder tapping, um, and more collaboration within the teams. Is that kind of cool? Do you guys already do that? Or do you guys do that? No? <laughs> okay. Bam. All right. So we talked about a little bit about self-service and how we uh, incorporate collaboration using Kanban boards and configuring your workflows and swim lanes and columns. Uh, let's talk a little bit, just a little bit about the accountability aspect. This is not my team's data, okay? Uh, but these are real screenshots of like something I, I would show my team. Accountability breeds responsibility. It gives teams a way to measure their success um, and metrics are great, right? I'm not gonna tell you what kind of metrics just to use, but like how do you use them and what does it mean? It's super valuable to have good metrics because for me, in this case, when I look at this and leadership comes ask me, okay, QPRs are coming up, what type of goals are we gonna set? I look at this and I'm able to propose specific QPRs around 
what these metrics say. So if there are a lot of overdue volumes, that tells me, OK, scoping is probably, they're not scoping their efforts properly. And so I would like us to work on that. And let's get zero overdue vulnerabilities in Q1. It's possible. I've done it. Um, OK. You might want to also show a trend. So we have SLA compliance percentage by org. So these are things I would show um, like directors or, or leadership. So they have a lot of teams that roll up into them. And the idea here, like show a trend, like six months or so. Because the whole idea is to share a story um, with that data. Uh, my favorite is the overdue vulnerabilities at the top right. This is important to me because, again, they're not scoping correctly. But if I see like a big number, like a lot of criticals or highs that are uh, overdue, then I sort of am able to focus in on that and see, ask myself, OK, what's going on over here? And most of the times, it's like, OK, if we apply a patch, it will fix like 100 different vulnerabilities. And so how can I um, offer my skill set to these developing teams? So yeah, I'm a security team's PM, but I will go in. I will help make labels for those vulnerabilities for those developing teams and then help them treat this as a project versus like this is just a one-off. So if there's like large, if, if this points out something to me, I will take that out, treat it as a project, a project as you do with anything else, not just vulnerability management. All right. So these are just some samples of what I'd show. Aside from showing this to leadership, um, there's metrics that I would show to management. So these are broken down. This is like an organization broken down per team. And this is always fun to use in, in meetings because it creates sort of healthy competition between everyone. Um, other than these metrics itself, if something, points, something is pointed out to me and needs immediate attention, how do I handle escalations around this and what types of forums are in place? So for me, I host a meeting every Thursday and my CISO is involved, all the managers and security, and then the, all the directors or VPs in the organization attend. 30 minutes of their time, every single week, same time. That's it. I set an agenda on Monday and I meet with them on Thursday. Everyone knows that this is going to happen every week. I don't cancel if we don't have anything. It's just It becomes a forum. If people want to show up, they can, but I'm always there. And this is the forum I use to handle escalation. So if teams are not fixing something and they say they're going to scope the work, this is where I would point out, OK, in this forum, we have 10 minutes of time and we dedicate this to vulnerability management. This is what's going on. So have, have those one-off meetings uh, or have those weekly meetings with your teams and stakeholders. OK, lastly, and my favorite part of vulnerability management, and the most important for you guys is to be successful, is the culture aspect. So I broke this down into training and to marketing. I essentially did a road show across all of engineering and showed them how to use the, the workflow I showed you, how to use JIRA, how to use their Kanban boards. Don't expect that everyone knows how to use it. It's, it's new to a lot of people, or they use it differently. So depending on how you configure it, it changes. Like if you drag. Um, tickets across like some people have it configured where it drags nicely to a specific status and some haven't configured it that way So don't assume that everyone knows how to use it um, I set expectations up with individuals leadership all at the same time and I always recommend continuous refresher courses My biggest success in my vulnerability management program is leveraging the security champions program, which I also run <laughs> um, Security Champions program is a great way to address vulnerabilities because um, that person acts like a, as a liaison between the security team and their individual teams. So in my Security Champions program, I have an uh, engineer from every single team in the organization, and I leverage them. To, to fulfill their duties as a champion, they have to do a couple different things. So out of the three things, they take uh, Stanford coursework. Um, they work on vulnerabilities, and then they work on a project with security. Those are my three criteria to be a champion. So I go heavy with the vulnerability management aspect, and I utilize them. And it's been super successful. You'll notice that teams with security champions have lower uh, vulnerabilities, less overdue vulns than teams without. On the marketing side, this is super fun because I take those metrics and I gamify it. I make it a healthy competition for everyone, or I host CTFs, uh, bug bashes. And whether you have budget or not, there's always a way to incorporate prizes. So like 
Flea over here in the front row. He's wearing one of my hat designs. <laughs> um, so sw swag, get some good swag out there. If you don't have budget, think of ways internally you can make this fun. So one quarter, I couldn't get some enough money to buy new t-shirts for everyone. So I said, okay, how can I do this that's free and make everyone excited? So I went to facilities and I asked them, all right, can I create custom badges for those who win the CTF or this, this bug bash I'm hosting? And they, I, was, I thought that they were going to say no, that they're going to be super strict. And they totally worked with me. And we made these really cool badges. And when they walk around campus, um, it's very unique because uh, we, don't, we don't usually do one-off badges for anyone. But when they see this specific badge, everyone gives these folks props. And it was free for me. So think of ways internally where you guys can, can uh, make it fun. And then branding. Again, my, my unicorn, I use this all the time. Everyone knows, I have, everyone knows when they see this sticker or this logo around my organization that security um, is involved in some way. And it's fun, it's like a happy image. Like it, people kind of like giggle around it. I have this big neon unicorn on my desk. And it just, it, little things like that really change people's perception of the security team. When I first started, like no one liked security. Everyone thought we, you know, just block them on doing every work. And like the relationship was super bad. Like it was awkward when I first started the conversations. I was like, oh, I don't know what I stepped into. But little things like this really change people's perception. So brand the hell out of your vulnerability management program or any program you guys are, are kicking off. All in all, I'd have to say that the things that really stand out to me in building any type of program is using the same language um, as your developers and your security team. Like, don't just go in thinking like this is the one way to do it. Like, listen, um, use the same systems that are already in place. Hold people accountable. So I held my security team accountable for um, inputting de uh, deliverables and actionable items in the tickets, not just doing the minimal that they could to triage and put a ticket in someone's queue. Listen to your audience and market the heck out of your, your program and make it fun. It's important to note that with any program, especially vulnerability management, that it is always improving and growing and becoming better. So it's uh, adaptive, my program's flexible, and it changes. So what I showed you today could be different than what it actually looks like in two months from now or next year. I hope that at, by this point, like you guys were able to relate a little bit or be able to judge like your program's health against what I'm doing, because I wish someone sort of told me what they were doing when I first started in this. Um, and I hope that you have some good tips in place and um, I shifted your perspective a little bit about how you manage vulnerabilities and not just being a subject matter expert in remediating a vulnerability. I applied all this into my current organization and job and has really have really transformed. Remember that first image I showed you of that broken vulnerability management um, graphic? It's not like that anymore. We, everything is transparent. Everyone's held accountable. Um, my metrics have severely changed. And it's just been a whole 180, not just with the program itself, but just how people view security in general. So I hope that you guys are inspired a bit to go back and, and apply some of these changes to your program. Thank you.